I'm Kristen Goodwin. On this episode of the Fox News Rundown, today marks 19 years since the September 11th terror attacks. Frank Stiller, chairman and CEO of the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, opens up about losing his brother, a firefighter, on 9-11. He also discusses what this year's ceremony will look like amid the coronavirus pandemic and what he wants younger generations to know. And October will mark one year since the world's most wanted terrorist, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, was killed during a U.S. raid in Syria. So are Americans safer today than we were four years ago? Former CIA station chief and Fox News contributor Dan Hoffman weighs in, discussing America's national security and how the nation continues to fight terrorism. Plus commentary by Guy Benson, host of The Guy Benson Show. The Fox News Rundown is a daily news podcast where we take a deeper look at the stories important to you. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast player by going to foxnewspodcast.com. I'm Harris Faulkner. I'm Greg Gutfeld. I'm Janice Dean. And this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, September 11th, 2020. I'm Lisa Brady. An annual tribute to the thousands of lives lost on 9-11 was almost canceled by coronavirus. Instead, it's expanding. We're going to do the lights in the, in the Pentagon and in Shanksville. So we're going to be shining those lights in two other locations that never had them before. I'm Jillian Turner. Is America any safer from terrorism 19 years after 9-11? It's important for us not to be complacent and understand that there are many out there in the world who seek to do us harm. And I'm Guy Benson. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. For anyone who lived through it, or the millions who watched the escalating horror unfold on TV. It's hard to believe 19 years have passed since September 11, 2001. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. The Al-Qaeda terror attacks that killed nearly 3,000 people when 19 hijackers used passenger planes as missiles, beginning in New York. And we're being told a second plane, a second plane crashed into the building on the opposite end. That's not an accident, that's on purpose. Then they crashed another plane into the Pentagon. Many in the building felt uh, a thud and heard kind of a muffled explosion. And a fourth plane, possibly heading for the nation's capital, crashed into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, as passengers fought back. By the time it was all over, less than two hours after the first plane hit, New York's Twin Towers had fallen, leaving blocks of debris covered in toxic dust and giant pieces of the tower's metal shell still smoldering three days later when President George W. Bush visited what became known as Ground Zero, cheered on by rescue crews and first responders. I can hear The deadliest single terror attack in human history and the worst ever on U.S. soil united the nation in an outpouring of grief, anger, and patriotism. And emotional memorials have followed around the country every year since, led by ceremonies at the crash sites. Christian Adams. Donald Leroy Adams. Families reading the victims' names, a big part of it in all three locations. And my cousin. Ferdinand V. Marone, superintendent of the Port Authority Police, who ran in to save others, making the ultimate sacrifice. But it won't be quite the same this year in New York. With pandemic precautions in mind, the 9-11 Memorial and Museum plans to play a recording of the names being read instead of having loved ones do it live. They also briefly canceled the annual Tribute and Light, twin beams shining miles into the air from near where the towers once stood. That's back on after New York's governor agreed to provide health personnel to alleviate safety concerns. But by then, a nonprofit group was already planning its own memorial for the first time. Yes, because in years past, we didn't have to because the 9-11 Memorial and the museum, their obligation, their first responsibility is to make sure that 9-11 is kept sacred and that we honor all those who perished, you know, in this case, 19 years ago. 
Frank Siller lost his firefighter brother on 9-11. He's chairman and CEO of the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, which builds homes for wounded veterans and the families of fallen service members and first responders. They didn't do it this year. They decided to just play a recording, and I'm sure they whitewashed it. They probably don't have any emotion in it, No, uh, no, nobody's comments, and, um, and it's just doesn't give a family an opportunity, a 9-11 family member, an opportunity to, you know, read their loved one's names out loud and and to say, hey, mom, I just graduated college or I just had my first baby or or dad, you know, you know, I, I just uh, I just became a firefighter or, you know, you know, you know, whatever the situation is, they don't have that opportunity to talk and let people know what happened 19 years ago. It's got to be kept, you know, it's important that we keep this day, that we read these names out loud in person on this day every year. And we're going to make sure that the Tunnels and Towers Foundation, so if they ever drop the ball again, we're going to make sure we pick it up in the future um, and, and do that. And, you know, they also decided not to do the Tower and Lights either, the Tribute and Lights. And, um, you know, we were doing that until two days later, they found the safe way of doing it, which has always been their um, excuse to not read the names or not even to do the, the tribute lights was it wasn't safe because of COVID-19. And I said, come on, you got to be kidding me. We could figure out a very safe way of doing it. And we did. In, in, in a matter of days, we figured out a very safe way uh, of doing it because uh, our most important thing is that we make sure we never forget and we won't let that happen ever. Right. And then they, as you say, they decided, well, we, we can do the tribute in light, but then their reading of the names portion was going to be a recording. And so and so you're you're picking that up and doing it on your own. Can you explain, though, I just want to focus on the tribute in light for a minute. Can you explain to people 19 years later why the tribute in light portion means so much? Because it, it's iconic. It, it is it is a symbol of what happened that day. When you look at those beautiful lights, blue lights shining in the skyline of New York City, you remember that those twin towers went down with so many people in it. 2,977 lives were lost 19 years ago, and we can't keep that day sacred. And and that we honor those who perished that day. There's something wrong with America. And uh, so, so, you know, you look at it and everyone looks at those lights and say, oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, they remember where they were, what happened. They tell their kids about 9-11 uh, once again, because it's iconic. And I'd like to add one thing, too, that we had the lights. We were doing it. Um, instead, we're going to do the lights in the, in the Pentagon and in Shanksville. So we, we're going to be shining those lights in two other locations that never had them before. Uh, which we're so honored that we'll make sure that these two locations are, are not forgotten and, and remembered. So we're proud. So out of that ridiculous decision that the 9-11 Memorial made, we, we are going to now do something that's so beautiful by having the lights not only in New York City, but in, in the Pentagon and in Shanksville. For the 9-11 museum ceremony, family members are still invited to attend. But the museum says given the health risks associated with large gatherings, an enormous amount of thought went into how to hold this year's event safely, and that they're committed to a commemoration as beautiful and meaningful as ever, while also protecting the well-being of families. The recordings being used for the names are part of the museum's In Memoriam exhibition. With the number of lives lost to COVID-19 in the U.S. now approaching 200,000, I also wondered about the ongoing challenge as time passes of putting 9-11 in perspective for future generations and what Siller hopes is learned from it. Well, it, so that is such a great question because they don't really teach what they should be teaching uh, enough about 9-11 in, in school. So our mission is, is the first mission of Tunnel to Towers Foundation is to never forget and honor the sacrifice. We build houses all over the country for our catastrophically injured service members, mortgage-free, smart homes. We pay off mortgages for fallen first responders who leave young families left behind that are killed and shot, and especially these police officers uh, recently. And, and Gold Star families also. Someone gives their life for their country and leaves a young family behind. We're going to pay off their mortgage or build them a, a mortgage-free home. We do all that. We're so proud that 
you know, that we're proactive and that we see, you could see the results of what my brother did and so many people did from 9-11 because he inspired his, his family. But our first responsibility is make sure that we never forget because if you forget, you know, history, things are going to happen again. And, you know, are they still trying to kill us? Yes, you better believe it. If, if uh, we didn't wipe out ISIS and, 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 and go in and take care of different caliphates, you know, it's, it's, they would come back here if we let our guards down. We're not going to do that because we, we, uh, we try to make sure that we, I know we make sure that we never forget. And we got to make sure America doesn't, and especially with the next generation uh, coming up that's, you know, 19 years ago, you know, somebody's just off to college. They have no idea, <laughs> you know, what happened. And, uh, but it's our responsibility to make sure they do know what happened. And so that's why we do the things that we do. And this is very personal for you after the loss of your brother, hero fighter fighter gave his life trying to help others on 9-11 and he was off duty at the time. Um, how far has the foundation come? How is your mission going? I know the American people are generous people, but you know, on the whole, how, how is it going for the foundation? Well, we, we're so proud of the work we're doing, and never in a million years did we think that our foundation was going to grow to what we're doing now. I mean, we are uh, they, 55 homes that we did last year alone, 55 mortgage-free homes last year. We're on pace for the same this year. And the 20th anniversary, I'm sure we're going to, we're going to, our goal is to do 100 mortgage free homes. Um, so, COVID 19, you speak of it before, you know, because it is a difficult time, so, many, so much loss of life, and it's mostly our elderly and those who have underlying health problems, you know, two, at least two comorbidities. Um, uh, we, as at the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, we delivered over 3 million PPE, personal protective equipment. All over, the, not just the tri-state area in New York area, we were in Washington, we were in Chicago, we were in Detroit, we were in Atlanta, we were in Florida. We, uh, we, had, we delivered stuff all over the United States because we knew that it's a serious, uh, it's a serious problem here. Uh, some of our hospitals were overwhelmed, most certainly in the beginning, but we found a very safe way. So we understand the, the, the urgency and the need to make sure you take this seriously. But we found a very safe way to make sure that we could read these names out loud, like I said, in person. And it just makes a world of difference for us. It, it's, it's easy to have two different podiums, only send one person up to each podium and keep them six feet away and, uh, and then clean them off in between the speakers. And it's almost not that quite that simple because we have to stage them away as they come up to, to the stage. You did mention that you've, you know, kind of expanding the mission during the pandemic, providing PPE, and in some cases, I know, temporarily covering mortgage payments for, for frontline healthcare workers, too. So what happens if someone donates to Tunnel to Towers right now? Does it all go into one pot? Do they get a choice of which frontline yeah. families they want to support? How's that working? Yeah, you can. You can. You, decide to help us with fallen first responders or catastrophically injured service members or COVID-19. There are, there are different ways that you can go to our website and just, but we ask everyone to donate $11 a month. Most Americans can do that. $11 a month. We had a million Americans donating $11 a month. We could take care of every police officer, every firefighter, every Gold Star family, every catastrophic injured service member that give their lives for the country or their body, their limbs for their country, that leave young kids behind every year. Every single year we could help every one of them if we had a million people donating $11 a month. I don't think that's hard to do. We're, well, we're on our way to, the, to doing that. Uh, we've had great uh, support. And uh, people see where their money goes. The great thing about our foundation is that people see a house getting paid off or a house being built. You know that's where your $11 goes. When you hear about a police officer that was just like killed in St. Louis uh, last, last weekend um, and we paid the, that mortgage off, he had three young kids under the age of 10, uh, people see where their money goes. And it's a good feeling that, you know, I don't take a salary. My family doesn't take a salary. We have oh, oh, this year will be 94 cents of every dollar goes to our uh, programs, uh, very few foundations can say these words that, you know, that w what we do and, and make sure that the money goes to those who, who, who really need it. So once again, $11 a month can really, I say the goodness of America, because you know, you know, America is great. It's good. 
But the goodness of America, the generosity of America, has to take care of the greatness of America. And who is the greatness? Those are willing to die for you and me. And that is the police officers, firefighters, and our military. We better take care of them. And we are. And we will. Tunnel to Towers Foundation, for sure. Frank Siller, Chairman and CEO of Tunnel to Towers. Thanks so much for all you do. Thank you. God bless. This is Guy Benson with your Fox News commentary coming up. Usually during a presidential election season, foreign policy and national security takes a backseat to domestic issues like employment and the economy. This year's no exception. So far, the coronavirus pandemic is sucking up most of the campaign trail oxygen, as it should, with nearly 190,000 Americans killed. But there was considerable talk about ISIS being defeated during the RNC recently, with multiple officials touting the defeat of ISIS as one of President Trump's signature first-term achievements. Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. Its evil leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is dead. And our brave soldiers, they're on their way home. Joe Biden is good for Iran and ISIS, great for communist China, and he's a godsend to everyone who wants America to apologize, abstain, and abandon our values. Donald Trump takes a different approach. He's tough on China, and he took on ISIS and won. President Trump demolished the terrorist ISIS caliphate in the Middle East and eliminated its leader, al-Baghdadi, one of the world's most brutal terrorists. Today's also September 11th. It's been 19 years since al-Qaeda executed the largest terror attack on U.S. soil in history, prompting President George W. Bush to launch the war on terror. And coming up in October, it's going to be one year since the Trump administration took out ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So now's a good moment to get a temperature check and ask, are we safer today than we were four years ago? I think that... The loss of Baghdadi hurts them. Dan Hoffman is a Fox News contributor and former CIA station chief. It certainly hurts their ability to recruit followers. And let's remember, too, that one of the lessons from 9-11 is the last thing you want to do is give our terrorist adversaries ungoverned space from which to plot attacks against us. And so destroying that was, was critical for us. There's no sign that uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's successor is anything of the sort of demagogue that al-Baghdadi was. But make no mistake, ISIS has a lot of those um, mid-level terrorist leaders who are still uh, hell-bent on targeting us worldwide. So that's interesting because last election cycle go around back in 2016, it seemed like ISIS still posed sort of potentially, you know, an existential threat to the U.S. Everybody was talking about it, both candidates, Trump and Clinton, all the time. This time around, because Baghdadi's gone, you say we've got these kind of mid-level guys running the operation. So should Americans still be concerned about terrorism? Should they factor in this election cycle the candidate's ability to do things like protect the homeland and Americans abroad from terrorists. Is this something they should be thinking about when they go to the polls or are we kind of in the clear? Yeah, I don't think we're in the clear. I do believe, look, if you asked Americans who Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is, I think a great majority of us would know the name, but his replacement, Abu Ibrahim uh, al Qureshi, probably a teeny tiny percentage of our population is, is even aware of him. And so I think there is a tendency for us perhaps to become a little bit complacent. We've got other things to worry about, like the coronavirus and economic crisis um, and uh, civil rights issues in this country and mass pro populist you know, protests. But it doesn't mean that the terrorist threat has, has gone away. And uh, you know, I think that one of the things we've seen is that the um, economic hardship and the coronavirus combined has provided um, the terrorist leaders with an opportunity to recruit followers and do so more effectively. Ah, so you brought me to my next question, which is really a lot of the world's attention has been focused on 
combating the coronavirus and the economic fallout in various countries. Here in the U.S., we've been hit particularly hard on both fronts, right, in terms of the virus numbers infecting Americans and in terms of the economic fallout. Do you think, though, their terrorist leaders are making inroads and trying to take advantage of the lack of attention on them? Does this give them uh, an advantage that they may not have had six months ago? Well, I, I think certainly there's the potential for our own, you know, homegrown, disaffected a population to be more susceptible to being recruited potentially by terrorists. And, and we know that that's a, a risk that, that we take, and it's something that the FBI focuses on to a great extent. But I would, too, highlight, I mean, the Trump administration has has had some, some significant successes that have really put some of these terrorist groups on their heels. Um, they've wiped out the leadership in al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, in fact, um, killing Ibrahim uh, al Asiri uh, in a drone strike in late 2017. Michael Morell, former acting director of CIA, said that was the most significant um, targeting operation since taking down bin Laden. So that was a big deal. But this is in the news because we're, the president is talking about removing our troops from Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and the question I think that our voters need to think about is well, is that going, that forward presence, is there there's some value to that? Um, in terms of uh, detecting and preempting threats before they're visited on, on our shores uh, or not. And that's, that's something I think I'd like to hear from both candidates about their own, their calculus about that. So for our listeners who aren't as familiar with some of these groups as you might be, as none of us really are, so you mentioned AQAP, which is shorthand for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in Yemen. That's a really strong offshoot. Um, of Al Qaeda, you mentioned President Trump has actually had a pretty major success with with that. So that's good news, right? The fact that you know maybe while ISIS is still out there, Al Qaeda's on the wane. At least its most powerful arm. Yeah, I mean Al Qaeda in the Peninsula. The the leader Qasem al Rimi, the Trump administration uh, targeted him. He was the Emir of of AQAP, targeted uh, just January of this year and killed. Uh, and that was the the offshoot of Al Qaeda that at least. We used to assess was the most potent, the, the greatest threat to the homeland. But Al Qaeda is going to, to grow in these failed states, and um, until those states are no longer failed states, they're still they're going to find it, you know, like a petri dish. They're going to grow, which is why I've always felt like we need to be out there in some form or fashion, diplomats, military intelligence, some forward deployed presence uh, out there on the front lines. If we look at the Biden record, because we're trying to talk 2020 here as well, um, on counterterrorism, he's Biden's really best known publicly anyway for his role planning the operation that killed Osama bin Laden while he was vice president. This was back in 2011. The sort of conventional wisdom, the story out there is that he was one of the few, if not the only voice in the Situation Room that really urged President Obama not to authorize the capture and kill of bin Laden at the time. So this has really come to define his legacy and record on counterterrorism. Is that fair? And then my next question to you is, is it that black and white? I mean, you just for our listeners, you were there, you were in the room at CIA when these decisions were being made in real time. Um, so tell us if you think it's fair to judge Biden on that one decision. I was in the room when a lot of those discussions were having were taking place about bin Laden, and we were looking at the intelligence and trying to determine as well as we could whether bin Laden was actually there or not there. And we didn't see him, so we couldn't prove with any degree of certainty that he really was there. Um, we used to take polls in the in the you know in the meetings uh, with our senior people and ask him, okay, how strongly do you feel he's actually there? Is it 50 percent, 60 percent? And the, I'll tell you, there were some hard counterterrorism, you know, CIA officers who have been doing this their whole lives who were at 50 percent. And some of them even said, no, we're not ready to do this yet. We need to collect more intelligence. What Director Panetta believed was that we had kind of run out of time. And the concern was that bin Laden was going to be moving from that location. And Panetta felt like we'd reached a tipping point. Vice President Biden 
had his view. Um, he was, I think, justifiably concerned about putting our SEAL team members at risk and flying into Pakistan without telling the Pakistanis that we were doing that um, with, you know, a kinetic operation on their territory. Um, there were huge risks there. I think from a political standpoint, you know, President Obama looked at that and thought, you know, if it's a 50-50 chance that he's there, how am I going to explain this to my constituents that I didn't act? And I think, frankly, being there, I can tell you, I think that had an impact on him. But the intelligence wasn't certain. And it's a classic case of making a, a very important decision without perfect information. I don't fault Vice President Biden for having those views. Um, what I will say that's interesting about him that's somewhat similar to President Trump, and I'd like to hear them both comment on this, after we killed bin Laden, Vice President Biden believed we should have just, we were done. We needed to retain maybe a very small counterterrorism force, but leave the region. And uh, a lot of us felt like even though we killed bin Laden, there was still more work to be done. And, and I wouldn't say that I necessarily agreed with the vice president at the time. Dan, a final thought from you here. When you look back to four years ago, the 2016 campaign cycle and where we were in September of that year before President Trump was elected in November, do you feel that when it comes to the war on terror, America has made progress? Do you feel like Americans are safer today than they were then? I definitely think we're a lot safer. Um, I think there's a lot of there's some a lot there's a lot of good reasons for that. Certainly, destroying the the physical caliphate, the ISIS caliphate, which the Obama administration began and the Trump administration ended it, and they also gave our military uh, the wherewithal to to do what they needed to do in a far more expansive capacity than Obama administration did. Uh, I think uh, destroying the Al Qaeda leadership and the ISIS leadership also makes us safer. Um, at the same time, it's important for us not to be complacent and understand that there are many out there in the world who seek to do us harm, not just state actors like Iran and North Korea, not to mention China or Russia, but disaffected um, terrorists who seek uh, to target us worldwide. And that's the essence of why we have these brave uh, patriots who, you know, for them, the, all that matters, the only mission that matters is, is keeping us safe here in the homeland. That, that's how they measure success. And I think on 9-11, as we remember the fallen, we also have to, I think, um, be thankful for all of those. And, and look, it's a teeny tiny small percentage of our population out there on the front lines protecting us. This is not World War II or Vietnam. We've got just teeny tiny numbers of troops and, and, and intelligence officers and diplomats and, and intelligence community writ large. And it's a time to remember them and be thankful for, for what they're doing. Dan Hoffman, thanks so much. Always great hearing from you, hearing your perspective and learning from you. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's always a pleasure and an honor. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, download and listen to The Untold Story with Martha McCallum. The host of The Story on Fox News Channel sits down with major newsmakers each week to get their untold story. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. A DNA test has turned a New York man from an only child to the eldest of three brothers. Mel Adler's daughter took a 23andMe DNA test, which changed his life. My daughter called me and said, hey, you know, you're not going to believe this. Sit down. You've got, you know, I found an uncle. Mel had been adopted as a baby and didn't know he had two younger biological brothers, Todd Neeson and Randy Bartlian. Neeson and Bartlian had grown up together in Wisconsin, raised by their mother Elaine, who had put Mel up for adoption years before they were born. Their father died when they were children. Elaine passed away in 2016, never telling them about their older brother from the same father. Bartlian says the new family dynamic does change things a little. One of the most shocking things about this whole discovery was that I was no longer the oldest child. Neeson says he's excited to get to know his new sibling. I'm just really excited and it's it's this is going to be a cool next chapter in our in all of our lives. And he thinks their parents would be happy they found each other. Assuming she's where I think she is and she has a better view of the world and everything like that, she's probably smiling. Yeah. 
I think so. That's too. what. And, and, and I'm pretty certain our father's smiling too. Yeah. This week, the brothers finally met at the Tampa airport, and Fox 13 Tampa Bay's cameras were rolling. Brother! <laughs> The three brothers later told Bay News 9 that they plan to spend the whole week catching up, first with a fishing trip, then a golf outing, and finally a trip to the shooting range. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Guy Benson. Benson. What's on your mind? Months ago, the Democrat-controlled House of Representatives passed a round four COVID relief bill. It was widely derided, even by the liberal media, as unserious and a wish list of left-wing, irrelevant policies. Since then, Washington has been at a standstill when it comes to needed coronavirus relief, with negotiations going nowhere. Senate Republicans put together a package that targeted some of the most urgent priorities, and it garnered majority support in the upper chamber. But Democrats, using the filibuster, a tool they're talking about getting rid of if they win back control in November, blocked the legislative process from even moving forward. Every single Senate Democrat voted to filibuster COVID-19 relief despite the acute needs of millions of Americans. Their calculation is that they'll get away with it because the press is on their side and this will remain a live issue for them to exploit and blame the president. It's up to voters to decide whether or not they pay any price. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.